Okay. So, uh, good morning, everybody. And um, two days lectures will be, I mean, there will be two lectures, roughly one hour, with, I guess, a short break in between, if I may do so. And uh, I've changed slightly the title because I will tell you in a moment what I want to focus on. Um, I will be mostly telling you about hard probes of uh, QCD matter. And only, and, and we'll focus on general uh, tools, theoretical tools that can be uh, useful in a broad variety of contexts. And only today, with the first lecture, will I say a few words about ultra relativistic uh, collisions. So let me start with ultra relativistic collision. So why, why are we uh, doing experiments uh, with heavy ions that we collide in, uh, in various places in the world, mostly nowadays at uh, the relativistic heavy ion collider at uh, so-called RIC in uh, Brookhaven National Lab, and since a few years at the Large Hadron Collider at CERN, at much higher energies. So why the standard answer to this is that uh, um, one wants to explore uh, new phases of matter. And this has been going on for many years. In fact, uh, the regime of ultra relativistic heavy ions started to be explored um, in the 70s with accelerators which were able to accelerate ions to energies of 1 to 2 GeV per nucleon. So this is ultra relativistic in the sense that the kinetic energy is larger than the mass of the particle, but not very much ultra relativistic. And in the last uh, 10, 20 years, one is really exploring um, a regime where the energy per particle is much, much higher than the mass of the constituent of the nucleus. So there are, I mean, new phases of matter uh, suggest that we try to understand the so-called phase diagram. So the phase diagram is something you will, heard, you will hear much more about in Gert's uh, lectures later today. And there are, the phase diagram is, uh, is a diagram which tells you uh, about the phases of matter depending on values of control parameters. Control parameters are parameters that you can vary at will. And depending on their values, you will, you will find different uh, phases of the matter. And in the particular context that we are discussing, the phase diagram uh, in the control parameters at least for what I'm going to, to talk about uh, are the temperature T and the chemical potential associated to baryon uh, conservation. So typically one draws a diagram with two axes. The particle axis is a temperature and horizontal axis is uh, baryon chemical potential. And what we, the picture we have at, at the moment of this phase diagram is that there is a regime with a crossover between different phases, which I draw by uh, this uh, dotted line here. Then there is a line possibly of first order phase transition. I don't end this line because all this is uh, at the moment essentially speculation. And at high density, which corresponds to large values of the chemical potential, we anticipate that uh, uh, a phase where the analog of BCS superconductivity uh, develop, namely the pairing of quarks with different colors. And uh, in, in this region of low temperature, low density, we have hadrons. As you probably all know, uh, 
one of the main focus of present uh, research is to explore uh, the possibility to reach the so-called quark gluon plasma where the main constituent the main degrees of freedom of the matter in this regime are the quarks and gluons of QCD. So when I was saying there have been uh, research on, on phases of matter, for those of you who are doing uh, low energy nuclear physics, there is of course a part of the phase diagram which I can draw here with, uh, uh, with a little uh, line like this. This is the so-called liquid gas phase transition uh, at lower energy. Uh, it comes about uh, from the following fact that uh, um, interaction between nuclei are attractive at reasonably short distance, intermediate to short distance, and very repulsive at, uh, at short distance. They are very much like van der Waals forces in ordinary uh, uh, fluids, and uh, such systems undergo a, a phase transition of the same type as a transition which, uh, uh, which occurs between uh, um, a liquid and a gas when you increase the temperature. And as you know, uh, in such uh, a liquid gas system, there is a critical point where you can no longer uh, distinguish between the gas and, and, and the liquid, and uh, this is what is indicated here. So there is much, uh, I mean, I think Gert will talk much more about that than I have time to do. There is much activity to try to locate this potential critical endpoint here in the phase diagram. And of course, a lot of activities to try to understand and control by theoretical means what is going on in this whole plane of, uh, of temperature and chemical potential. And of course, I have talked about, I have mentioned two control parameters. You can think. Uh, you can contemplate the possibility of adding extra one, like a strangeness chemical potential, uh, magnetic field, uh, and, and other things, which to some extent can be controlled. So this parameter, when I say these are control parameters, they are indeed quantities which can be uh, changed by changing the, uh, the, the, the energy of the collision, so these parameters are function of square root of S, where S is the um, uh, center of mass energy. And at the LHC, uh, for instance, it's essentially zero. Like in the very early universe, where this kind of consideration, of course, uh, may apply uh, at the uh, I mean, the matter, the quark gluon plasma is a state of matter that we expect according to standard uh, theory of the uh, Big Bang uh, and expansion of the universe. Uh, it's a state of matter that we expect in the first uh, tens of uh, microseconds after the Big Bang. And this is a regime where the baryon chemical potential will be uh, vanishing. I should also mention that uh, uh, this phase diagram has another importance for uh, exploration of uh, object, compact stars, a neutron star, which may involve in the formation uh, a region of the phase diagram at high density and not too high temperature, but uh, in the recent um, observation of the merging of neutron star, at the moment of merging uh, before forming a black hole, there are states of matter with high density and temperature in the 100 MeV range that could be, that could be reached. So this is another fascinating uh, uh, field which is just uh, emerging uh, nowadays and which you will hear about more in the lecture by Sanjay uh, Reddy uh, next week. So having said that, I want to emphasize one important issue is that we are dealing with non-equilibrium system. I mean, the description of heavy ion is complicated in many respects. You see, we would like to get information about um, thermodynamic properties, which are basically properties of matter in equilibrium. 
The dream will be to be able to make a big box with quark-gluon plasma inside at sufficiently high temperature and observe how uh, by compressing or rising the temperature uh, the state of matter will change. We, we cannot, unfortunately, do that. Now, um, that has several, uh, several implications. Uh, even though the system is not in equilibrium, there is evidence from experiment that some form of equilibrium is rich during the collision. There are evidence, I mean, I don't want to go too much into the details of the phenomenology, but there are, there are good evidence for, from uh, uh, particle, count, just counting particles, uh, they are extremely well um, accounted for by uh, statistical distribution with the temperature and the chemical potential. Um, this is also used by, um, uh, let's say, equilibrium concept are used in a theoretical description. Alors, uh, uh, there are two reasons for, for that. One is that it simplifies the life tremendously if you are able to discuss. And, and let, let, me, let me specify what I have in mind. This is at the basis, for example, of hydrodynamic. Oh, hydrodynamics, which is uh, very successful in describing the behavior of matter produced in heavy ion collisions. Now, hydrodynamics assume that the matter is locally in, 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 in equilibrium. So it simplifies, it's much simpler than having to deal with a full general of equilibrium problem. And also, it connects directly to thermodynamics properties that we are interested in. Because what enters the equation for, um, uh, for fluid dynamics Are I mean, there are local conservation of energy and momentum, and what enters there as a basic ingredient is a so-called equation of state. And equation of state is directly connected to what we want to learn about. Equation of state, speed of sound, and more generally transport coefficient that I will uh, discuss more in a, in, a, in a moment. So. We have to keep in mind that we are dealing with uh, uh, a non-equilibrium system. A priori, the description is complicated. However, uh, perhaps we have evidence that a reasonable approximation using equilibrium concept or nearly near to equilibrium concept could be uh, useful. How do we probe the matter? Before I say that, let me mention that there are various stages. In an ultra relativistic uh, heavy ion collision. And uh, many particles are produced. A typical collision at the LHC, you have two lead nuclei produced uh, 20,000, 20, 25,000 particles. Most of these particles are pions, or kaions and light hadrons. And uh, they are mainly sensitive to the late stage of the collision. These are the particles whose abundances are very well described by a statistical distribution. So there, there, are, uh, there are other types of particles. So, so Various stages, yes. But there are, there are particles which are produced at very early stages of the collision. In fact, in, in, in a way, most particles are being produced very early on. At high, I mean, at low energy, you can think of nucleons as collection of, uh, as nuclei as collections of nucleons. And uh, to understand the collision of two nuclei at low energy, you, you have a very good picture by a, uh, making uh, two collections of nuclei collide independently of each other. 
when you increase the energy, you start to produce uh, hydronic resonances. Situation becomes complicated. And when you go to very high energy, like at the LHC, uh, nuclei don't see themselves as collection of nucleons. They see themselves as collection of gluons. I'll say more about that in a, in a few minutes. So the typical degrees of freedom which are involved in the collision changes as a function of energy. And uh, at the LHC, most of particle production goes through a phase, a very early phase, where gluons are produced in large amounts. And uh, clearly, um, it's not the same type of particle which are going to carry information about this early stage than the particle that we see uh, in abundance at the end of the, of, the of the collision. And some of these particles are they are produced early and well, they are produced early. Typical example, uh, for instance, the W and Z bosons, heavy quarks, uh, quarkonia, namely bound states of heavy quarks, and, and, and others, I mean, hard photons, etc., etc. And these hard probes is what is going to occupy us in particular heavy quarks and quarkonia in, uh, in the following lectures. But let me continue by saying a few uh, general remarks of, uh, about hard probes. Um, yes, they are produced early and uh, um, their production, and that's important, can be calculated. This is because they are produced at short, on short time and space-time scale, at short distance and on short time. They are hard because they, they are involving high energy, uh, where collision, where, where the interaction strengths are, are, are small. So they can be calculated using so-called perturbative QCD. And the typical the typical processes that uh, uh, we are going to, I mean, we are going, uh, that's involved in these uh, processes, we have a nucleus A colliding, say, with nucleus B. So there is one constituent of nucleus A and one constituent of nucleus B. Let's call this one I, this one J. Let, say, the momentum of, of this uh, parton I is X1, the one of XJ is X2, and then there is a collision between these two constituents. You produce your hard probe plus anything else. And this can be calculated because the cross-section, because the factorization theorem, this is a cross-section to produce a hard probe with transverse momentum uh, PT in this collision will be typically, let me not put equal, the product of an object which I call Fi of X1 convoluted with another uh, similar object, Fj for B of X2 convoluted with a cross section Ij going to H, the hard probe, uh, which can be a function of the kinematical variable x1, x2. The notation x here is something I will eventually come back to. It's a, it's a fraction of the longitudinal momentum carried by the constituent of the, of which I'm considering. This is a standard notation in the, this high energy framework. So what I mean by factorization theorem is the fact that uh, you see there is a cross section here where the two constituents of the nucleus A and B interact, that can be calculated. And then there is so-called uh, parton distribution function, which cannot be really calculated, but they have uh, 
universal property. So this and this are important distribution function. They are universal property in the sense that uh, um, they, can, they, they are the same independently of the collision process that you look at. So you can measure them in one experiment and use this information to do a calculation in another experiment. And the factorization means that the information you have about this part on distribution um, factorizes from what happens when these two parts on interact, which you can calculate using techniques of quantum field theory. Okay? So one of the characteristic production of this hard probe is that in principle, this is not always true, but in principle you can calculate uh, their production. So you know how many you have in a given collision and you know their kinematic properties. You know the distribution as a function of uh, transverse momentum, for instance. Now, I was mentioning typical hard probe. For the W and Z bosons, which are produced by uh, typical processes like this, these hard probes don't interact very much with the produced matter that they are produced and then they escape without being too much affected by, uh, by the environment. So these are good hard probes in a way, but they don't tell us too much about the matter which is being produced. However, by measuring carefully their, their cross-section, I mean the number uh, counting how many they are, we can get information about this uh, structure function here, and in particular, we can get information about potential modification of this part on distribution in matter. Part on distribution, and we have many evidence for that, are different in a nucleus than for a free proton. The part on distribution of a nucleus is not simply the addition of the part on distribution of each individual nucleon. And that modification is something which is hard to calculate, but which can be measured by uh, considering this type of hard probes. But the main issue that we want to address, of course, is uh, it's not so much what happened with W and, and Z, but what happens with, for instance, heavy quark or quarkonia, which are strongly affected by their propagation through the medium. So these are produced very early on. Uh, we know more or less how to calculate their number, more or less, uh, I should say, it's, uh, it's, it's, there are many complications, so it's not so obvious. This calculation for WAZ is straightforward. For, for Quaconia, it's, uh, it's much more involved. However, let's say, let's assume we know how to calculate their production. And then what we want, what we are really interested in, is to study how the propagation through the matter, which is produced at the same time as they, as they are, is modified. Okay? And by uh, this uh, careful study, we hope to learn something about the matter in which they propagate. Um, you should feel free to interrupt me uh, any time. Uh, if you have questions, I mean, it's, uh, it's always hard when we start lecturing uh, to an audience uh, whom we don't know too well. Uh, is what I'm saying familiar to some of you? You, you have a question. Yes. yes. Oh, yes, that's a cross-section to produce, uh, I'm sorry, I should have put, to produce one of these hard probes, which I call H, uh, in a collision of nucleus A against nucleus B. Okay, sorry. It's, if you wish, it's a probability to produce in such a collision uh, one of these hard probes. And what I'm saying is that, grosso modo, it can be calculated because of this uh, factorization theorem that I was referring to. Yes, um, in fact, there is a, a way to quantify that, which is, uh, I'm not going to talk too much about that, but this is so-called RAA of PT, which experimentalists use to, um, 
to uh, quantify how much an actual nucleus, nucleus collision differ from a collection of independent nucleon-nucleon collisions. So you can calculate, um, let's say, the number um, it's called RAA, but let's see. <laughs> let, me, let me call the two nuclei A and B the same cross section here, uh, DPT, divided by the number of collision. That's the number of nucleon nucleon collision, which you can estimate. Uh, it's not something you measure, but it's easy to estimate. Uh, multiplied by DNPP or nucleon nucleon uh, DPT. So this can be, uh, this is easy to determine experimentally uh, uh, up to this number here, which is rather well under control. And what we find, for instance, for W and Z, that this ratio is close to 1. Okay? And for the other, a particle is much slower than one. I mean, the heavy quark, quark cognac, which suggests a strong effect of the medium, what people refer to as final state interactions. Yes? So in this picture of factorization, once assume that a single scattering, but is there any case in which you can have multiple scattering? Yes. Does this hold? Or? Uh, 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 with, with some uh, modification, it, it would hold. I mean, it's a, it's a, what you are referring to is that multi-parton interaction. Um, and uh, that, there is absolutely no reason why that should not be important. And in fact, it, is probably, it, it probably is at the LHC for some, some reaction. But the factorization is a little bit more tricky because um, here you, you just you just count on the probability to find one parton with a given characteristic in a nucleus. If you have two, then you have to start worrying about the correlation between these two partons. And that correlation function is not something we, don't, we, we know very well. And do you expect yeah. this to perhaps go away as PT is very large? Or when do you expect this? Oof. Uh, uh, let, let's say I, I, I don't know. I don't have, some, I don't have this uh, fresh in my mind, so I, I, I don't know. I can think about it, but uh, uh, it's not obvious which way it goes at the moment. Okay. Yes? Yes, 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 yes. The number of collision is not something you count experimentally. It's something you take from a model. So Glauber model is, uh, is a standard. Of course, there are many Glauber models, but basically, I mean, there is kind of a consensus among experimentalists to, uh, on this number. But, but this is not something you can uh, determine experimentally. Um, yeah. Yeah, is, uh, does this answer your question? <laughs> okay. So let, let, let me move on. I mean, you can, you can uh, raise your hand any time. I mean, it's, uh, it's good for me that I hear what kind of question you have in order to, uh, to adjust. But this is very, I mean, kind of, I mean, for, for this hour, this is a mundane talk. I mean, it's just, uh, I'm just uh, uh, making an overview of some of the concepts which uh, I would like you to have in mind and which will be helpful for the discussion to follow and which will start uh, later on. So I, I want to say something more about early stage. And uh, the reason I want to do that is to introduce two important concepts. One is the saturation momentum. Sobas. And the other concept is uh, uh, Dubai screening lengths. So this is why 
uh, why has this to do with early stage? Well, there is no genuine uh, theory of the early stage, but some theoretical construct, uh, which, um, uh, uh, which build on the idea that, uh, indeed, initially, you have these two nuclei which approach each other. As I was saying earlier, they don't see nucleon. I mean, each, each nucleus doesn't see the nucleon in the other one. They just see a, a, a beam of gluons, which are the constituent of the nucleons in each of the nuclei. But they overlap in a, in a complicated fashion. So you just see gluons coming in front of each other. These gluons have various momenta, and uh, the low momentum modes are highly occupied. And I will say more about that uh, later in the lectures. And in that circumstances, it is not a bad idea to consider that uh, they form a classical field. Uh, and you will hear about that in the lecture by Raju Venugopalan at the end of the week. Um, uh, uh, this classical field is sometimes called a glasma. Uh, it is at the root of the Maclaren Venugopalan uh, model. And um, in this picture, um, a, a natural scale emerges, which is the, 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 the saturation momentum. So let me, let me say more about that. Um, let me, first of all, uh, tell you what the saturation momentum is by writing an equation on the board, and I will comment this equation. So it's alpha strong, Q squared, so QS squared is proportional to alpha strong. It's proportional to the density of gluon, which uh, is conventionally written as X times G of X. This object is, in a sense, the same object as what I call F sub i here, uh, but for gluon it's traditional to write it in this form, divided by pi r squared. So I will uh, tell you how you get there in a, in, a, in a second, but let me try to explain why there is this particular scale by drawing a diagram, it's again kind of a phase diagram, where the control parameter here are the log of Q squared over lambda QCD squared and the log of 1 over X. Um, these variable X and Q squared, they are variables which are natural in, uh, in deep inelastic scattering. Deep inelastic scattering is uh, is a measurement that helps you to determine the, um, uh, the wave function, if you wish, of a proton in terms of its constituent by shooting an electron, which will exchange a, a, a virtual photon with one of the charged particles, namely the quarks. And the Q squared here is a measure of the virtuality of, the, of, of this exchange photon. X is, so uh, X is a variable which is uh, related to the fraction of momentum carried by, by the proton. So as X decreases, um, you are probing constituent of the proton which carry a smaller and smaller value of this momentum. Now, what is important to understand is that the number of constituent grows as 1 over x or q squared grow. Um, I can draw a little cartoon. Here this is a proton with let's say 3 quark at relatively low values of q squared. If I increase Q squared, what happens is that, why, well, 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 first of all, why, why does the number grow? The number grows because a gluon can split into two gluons. 
And each of these two gluons can split into two other gluons. So when you increase Q squared, you are looking in the transverse plane of the proton. Imagine a proton going very fast in one direction. You increase the resolution in transverse area at which you are looking at the proton. And if you increase the resolution, you see that here, if you have a resolution which is that big, you will see only one constituent. If you have a resolution which is this big, you will see two. So as you increase the resolution with which you probe the proton, you will increase the number of constituents. But Q squared is also a typical, if you think of uh, uh, Q squared as somehow measuring a wavelength, one over Q squared is the size, or one over square root of Q squared, is the size, the transverse size of the particle. So you increase the number, you decrease the size, and this is a picture you get. That's called, I mean, this is, this is governed by so-called Diglap uh, evolution, or Dokshidzer, Gribov, Lipatov, Altarizi, Parizi. We are the first to, 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 to uh, formalize all this. And then when you increase x, for the same reason, uh, when you decrease x, you increase 1 over x. And it's the same mechanism here that you increase. Uh, OK. You, uh, um, you, you decrease the energy carried by each individual constituent. So you're looking at constituents which carry a smaller and smaller fraction of the energy. So again, that is an increase. But now, if you go in this direction at fix Q squared, here is that fix X, you increase the number of constituent, but you don't change the size. So you see, you, you reach a regime where uh, in the transverse plane, the, the constituent entirely covers the area of the proton. And that's a regime which we call saturation. And obviously, there is a boundary between this uh, dilute regime and this saturated regime. And that's determined by what we call QS squared, which is a function of x. Now, this formula here, how can we get it without too much effort? In the dilute regime, you expect perturbation theory to be OK. Now, what is perturbation theory? In gauge theory, perturbation theory uh, amounts to, to compare momenta or derivative uh, with re and, and the strength of the gauge potential. Okay, you have covariant derivatives. And perturbation theory means that the free motion, which is governed by, by gradients, is, is dominant compared to the interaction, which is g times a. I'm not worried about gauge invariant issues and things like this, which are the delights of theoreticians. I mean, just uh, using a crude argument. So I want to compare a situation. I, I want to, 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 to find when perturbation theory st stops to make sense. Let me take a squared here. So it will stop to make sense when a typical momentum in the transverse direction, which I call q squared, of the order of the gradient squared, is of order g squared, a squared. And let me take the average. So that's a fluctuation of the field. And we will be talking a lot about fluctuation of fields in the, in the following lectures. And this is what? This is alpha squared. Uh, this is alpha, alpha strong. G squared is alpha strong, up to a factor 4 pi. And what is the fluctuation of the gluon field? The fluctuation of the gluon field is up to a number. Uh, which I will fix in a second, uh, it is just the gluon density. It's just x, g of x and q squared. And now a squared, a 
is an operator which, is, which has the same dimension as a derivative. So it's 1 over some length. And the only length you have, or the only area you have in this game is the transverse area of the proton. And now you see, this condition here is just a condition which a perturbative description of the system stops to make sense. So really, this condition here is a condition where perturbation theory, which is OK in this regime of, of dilute parton system, and which is at the basis of the so-called Diglap equation, uh, stops, to make, uh, uh, stops to make sense. Actually, to be fair, I should have mentioned here that there is other names associated to this particular evolution in, 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 uh, at fixed Q squared, which is BF. KL, which I guess those of you who are in the field have certainly heard about. So this is QS, but let me say more about that because that will be important for, for the rest of the lecture. Uh, at saturation, I have QS squared is alpha strong, x, g of x, and QS divided by pi r squared. And then I can, uh, I can modify this. I can rewrite this equation by saying that uh, x, g of x, and QS divided by uh, pi r squared times Q squared is 1 over alpha strong. Now, you see, this quantity here I can regard as a phase space occupation number. See, this ratio, x g of x divided by pi r squared, is the number of gluon per unit area in the transverse plane. And 1 over q squared is just the area is gluon. So what I'm saying here is that the total number of gluon in one of this area here in the transverse plane is of order 1 over alpha strong. So this is, what, and if alpha strong is small, this will mean a large occupation. Of soft mode. This is, by soft mode, I mean uh, mode with with transverse momenta which are less than QS. And that's one characteristic aspect of the saturation regime, and that's why uh, one talks about classical field, because when the modes, the soft modes, are, are over-occupied uh, by a, 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 a strength of order 1 over alpha, uh, usually we can do a pretty well classical approximation. There is one other aspect that I want to mention. I think all this will be discussed in much more detail by uh, Raju in his lectures, but I will need that to make connections uh, at the later stage. Uh, the other remark I want to make is that x g a over uh, X G A. I said earlier that the distribution function for a nucleus is not the sum of the distribution function for individual nucleon, but that's nevertheless approximately true. So X G A is approximately equal to A times X G for protons. Okay. So X G A over pi r squared is since r is of, is R is A to the one third, so this is of order A uh, to the one third, and that QS, A. Uh, QS for, for A squared. So that means that if you have a big nucleus, you increase a little bit. A to the one third is not a very rapidly growing function, but you increase, um, you increase the value of QS, 
And that's part of the motivation for uh, doing uh, deep inelastic experiments on, the, um, on nuclei, that such experiments will be done uh, in the future, near future, in, at least in the US in the electron-ion collider, which is going to be built in uh, Brookhaven. Um, and uh, part of the motivation is coming from this consideration, that uh, by using nuclei, we can reach larger values of QS, or say differently, we can explore smaller values of, uh, of the X. Um, okay. The last thing I wanted to emphasize is that, you see, this equation here uh, suggests that alpha strong in this equation is a function of Q squared. Now, I should put an S here because this is a self-consistent equation. <coughs> but you see, if the solution of this equation is large, then alpha strong is small. So saturation is a regime which can be, in principle, if QS is sufficiently large, uh, described by weak coupling techniques. Now, you should be careful here. Weak coupling doesn't imply perturbation theory. And in fact, it is a non-perturbative weak coupling situation. Uh, it's non-perturbative because uh, we have a number of particles present. So it's one of these typical systems in many body physics that uh, even though uh, the coupling is very, very small, you may have strong uh, effect of interaction because many, many particles contribute coherently to the effect. I mean, other example in, in many body physics is uh, superfluidity or superconductivity. It are typically example of weak coupling regime where you can have uh, nevertheless uh, deep uh, change in the property of the system because there are many uh, cooperative uh, uh, particles present. Okay, so this was all I wanted to say for QS. And now the second uh, important scale that I wanted to have is the by scale. So this is so this is a phase. It is assuming that there is this phase of gluon uh, of gluonic matter at the beginning of the collision. We expect it to turn into a coagulon plasma with some degree of thermalization. And one of the important phenomenon in a plasma is a screening of the long-range interaction. So this is a familiar effect. Screening of long-range interaction. And um, um, this is characteristic, characterized in the ordinary plasma by a Debye screening length, which reflects the competition between two effects. Effect of the kinetic energy of the particle, which are going to screen the interaction, and that's proportional to uh, the temperature. Kinetic energy of particle in a plasma temperature T is proportional to kinetic energy and uh, the effect of the density. So the larger the kinetic energy, the larger the uh, screening length, the larger the density, the smaller the screening length. And there is a charge, the electric charge. So this is a formula, the standard formula for screening lengths in the plasma. In the QCD plasma, well, even in QED, but uh, uh, in, in ultra-relativistic plasma, the density is proportional to the cube of the temperature. We are dealing essentially with massless particle. And the screening length is usually expressed in terms of the Debye mass, which is the inverse of the screening length. And that is proportional to E, or let's, let me call G times T, where G is nothing but the electric charge. I mean, the analog of the electric charge for, for, for electromagnetism. And that's about what I want to say about uh, uh, the Debye screening lengths. Uh, the Debye mass is proportional, uh, is proportional to the temperature. It's proportional to the gauge coupling. But uh, in real 
real calculation. We are not, you, well, it, it, it suggests that uh, the by mass, this relation suggests that the by mass is small compared to temperature. So in, in genuine weak coupling, where G is much bigger, much smaller than one, so the M de by is much smaller than the temperature. In fact, for temperature which are of the order of the deconfinement temperature, a couple of two, three, four, five hundred MeV, uh, G is, is of order two. So the de by mass, I will write in what I will do, the de by mass as C times the temperature, where C is a constant, and C is a constant of all the actual application. So the Dubai mass, keep in mind that the Dubai mass is a number of the order of temperature. Um, there is a, a lot of literature associated to this. It goes under the name of hard thermal loops, to which I shall refer eventually in the lectures. Um, let me just ask, how many of you have heard about hard thermal loops? Okay, that's a fair amount. <laughs> okay, so we will, you, you will hear more about that in the, the following lectures. It, it's a useful concept. For those of you who are in, in lower energy nuclear physics, this is nothing but the generalization to non-abelian theory of what is called in many body physics a random phase approximation. Um, it's also used in plasma physics. Okay. Um, yes, I still need uh, five minutes, maybe, to tell you more about uh, what the following lecture will be about, namely heavy quarks and quarkonia. You're still with me, or? Yeah? Okay. Um, so, heavy quarks, as I said, these are particles, these are typical hard probes. They are produced early in the plasma or in the collision. Their number is conserved. That is to say, if you produce uh, 10 at the beginning of a collision, uh, there will remain 10 at the end. Of course, they may, uh, their life will depend on many things, and they may form bound states. I will talk about that later or they just uh, scatter with the rest of the particle and uh, get some uh, broadening of the momentum. And they are weakly affected by the system. There are not so many. The plasma is big, and their interaction is not so strong with the system. So we can use um, kind of weak coupling techniques to, to handle them. The first thing I want to mention, the mass is much bigger than the temperature. Um, and that's uh, one of the reasons why uh, the number is conserved, because there is no thermal excited uh, uh, quark-antiquark pair of heavy quarks. And I can calculate the thermal wavelengths. Thanks is... Uh, uh, is 1 over the typical momentum. Now, the momentum of a, a non-relativistic particle, yeah, they are relativistic. I will, I mean, it's a self-consistent argument. I will show that in, in a second. The momentum for a non-relativistic particle is m times the velocity. Well, that's not even approximate. This is equal. And mv the order of temperature. Okay, that's the equipartition theorem for non-relativistic particle in thermal equilibrium. And from there, I deduce that the thermal velocity, actually I can take it from here by putting V thermal everywhere. So V thermal is given by the square root of T over M, which is much smaller than one, the speed of light. So to good approximation, the heavy quark behave as uh, a non-relativistic particle in the medium. Now, let me return to the thermal wavelengths. 
The thermal wavelength is 1 over p. P is mv thermal. mv thermal is square root of t over m. If you put everything together, you find 1 over square root of mt. And let me write this as 1 over t times square root of t over m. Okay? Now, that means that in the regime which I consider, where m is much bigger than t, this is much smaller than 1 over t. But what is 1 over t? If I am in a plasma with massless particle, 1 over t, I mean, remember the density is t cube. So 1 over t is typically the distance between the plasma constituent. Distance between plasma constituent. So that means that the thermal wavelength of this particle is small compared to the typical distance uh, between the, uh, the constituent. And that will allow us to, uh, to do eventually, later on, a uh, semi-classical approximation. See, when, the wavelength, when this thermal wavelength is small, I mean, anticipating on concept that I will introduce in the next uh, lecture, the density matrix of this particle is almost diagonal. I mean, the, the off-diagonal is uh, the range of off-diagonal uh, uh, matrix elements is carried by the thermal wavelengths. And when the mat density matrix is diagonal in, in, in coordinate or momentum space, you can, you can develop a useful semi-classical semi -classical approximation. Now, I was saying that 1 over t is a distance between the plasma constituent, but that's also the thermal wavelength of the plasma constituent. Plasma constituent, massless particle. So the uh, momentum is a temperature up to numerical factor, and 1 over t is a thermal wavelength. So you see, for the plasma particle, um, the thermal wavelength is always of the order of the distance between them, which means that they always interfere. And that's the reason why the plasma particle cannot be treated classically. They, they obey Bose-Einstein or Fermi-Dirac distribution. Uh, that's important to keep in mind. Now, what can happen to the heavy quark? Well, the heavy quark, as I was saying, will propagate like... Sure. The diagram I just drew, uh, erased. Ah, here, yes. That, that will be the transverse momentum, yes, of the, of the gluon. So the tra what I'm saying, you see, if you, if you imagine, I mean, there are ma many ways to think about the very early stage of the collision, but if you imagine, um, as it is sometimes done, that uh, you have two collections of gluons which collide and, and get freed by, the, you see, they are virtual uh, constituent initially. They are part of a wave function. So if, if the nucleons pass by each other, the, 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 this fluctuation will not do anything. Okay? But if they collide, this parton will become on shell particles, roughly. Okay? And uh, they will be produced with some various uh, transverse momenta. And uh, the transverse momenta, I mean, I can classify the parton according to the transverse momenta. And what I'm saying is that those which have a transverse momentum uh, smaller than this QS will be completely overlapping and will... Uh, uh, and will be in the saturation regime. So by looking at different rapidity classes and different PT classes, one can explore different phases of this diagram? Yes, in principle, yes. In principle, yes. And there are, there are measurements in which you can... Uh, uh, this has not been done yet, as far as I know, uh, for nucleus-nucleus collision, but in proton-nucleus, you can choose a kinematic so that you probe different region of X of the, of the nucleus. Okay? Yes. Um, but this was nothing... Uh, this was a, a parenthesis. Um, yes. So I can erase now. <laughs> 
So I, wa I want to say, uh, yeah, uh, I am a little bit behind schedule, which is to be anticipated, but, uh, <laughs> but I, I, I will make a break in a, in a, in a few minutes. I, I would like to finish this. It's okay? Yeah, okay. Um, so what I was saying is that uh, I, I was going to consider what can happen to the heavy quark. And the heavy quarks will behave very much like a Brownian particle uh, in, in this system. So this is a heavy quark trajectory, if you wish, and it will collide with plasma constituent, essentially by exchanging uh, gluons. Uh, so this represents collisions with the, uh, with the, um, with the plasma constituent. And what's important to keep in mind is that most of the collision have a very small momentum transfer. Um, in other words, uh, if you want to deflect the trajectory of the heavy quark by a significant amount, you need to do many, many collisions. So this is a regime where um, you can treat the effect of collision by uh, using Fokker Planck uh, or Langevin equations, which are essentially uh, two equivalent ways to uh, uh, to phrase uh, what is going on. And let me just give you uh, one equation, one example of a Langevin equation. Langevin equation is an equation which contains, uh, which describes how the velocity of a particle evolves. There is a term proportional to the velocity, which is commonly called a drag term. And then there is a noise term, Noise reflects the effect of this collision, which, uh, which will generate a diffusion in momentum space. And the, what you have to say about to, to be able to solve the Langevin equation is how uh, this noise is correlated. And in most applications, one assumes that uh, the noise is a so-called white noise with some parameter eta here. Uh, which reflects the correlation, I mean, which, is, which characterizes the correlation function. And um, the delta ij here is, is just uh, an oversimplification because this, it assumes that the kicks uh, given to the heavy quark are, are somehow isotropic, which is not quite the case. And, um, the, and also this approximation here that things uh, happen instantaneously is also an oversimplification which means that uh, all the kicks are independent. There is no memory effect. What happens to the quark at a given time is, depends only on the position of the quark at that time, not on the memory of its trajectory before. You will see that in the more elaborate description that, I, I will, uh, that we shall arrive at, this kind of approximation will be, uh, will be relaxed. And it's part of the difficulty of the game, actually, to take into account this uh, momentum effect. I think I will, I will, make a, I will uh, uh, accept that I am behind schedule, make a break here for five minutes, <laughs> um, and uh, you can ask questions, and, uh, or you can just relax, and we'll resume in, a, in, in, yes, in five minutes. Okay. Yeah, I, I, I'm too slow. <laughs> If some of you don't dare to ask questions publicly, you can come here and... <laughs> uh, how you detect that? I mean, it should, should, be, it should have been the back row, so... <laughs> we're sleeping. <laughs> okay, thanks. Uh, it's better now, yeah. <coughs> I, I can't hear because my voice is becoming a little bit uh, sore. Um,
So the idea of, of, of this gentleman is that if, if the temperature is sufficiently high, the force is screened on, on short distances and the possibility to form a bound state just uh, disappear. So this is the origin of the famous suppression of, of a JSI in, uh, in a heavy ion collision. A phenomenon which, in fact, has been observed. Nowadays, uh, even more things have been observed. At Alice, for example, uh, there is indication that uh, uh, this suppression not only is tamed, but uh, there could be uh, more particles produced, more JSI produced and anticipating. This goes under the name of regeneration. Um, where it is not a very good name for reasons that I will try to explain. Um, it's, a, it's a topic on which the literature is, uh, is quite vast. Um, and I think I'm not going to, to go through what I intended to do today. I will just mention a number of keywords uh, because uh, which points to works, ty type of works which have been done to try to understand what's going on in this, uh, in this field. So there are potential models where we tried various uh, ansatz for the potential. There is uh, a lot of discussion of what the potential is. In particular, should we associate the potential to the free energy or to the internal energy? There are approaches based on T matrix. Um, uh, there are uh, a lot of activities based on spectral function that probably Gert will uh, mention a little bit in his lectures. Um, uh, spectral functions are interesting because they, uh, they carry the, 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 the possibility to make contact with lattice calculation. Uh, a recent development points out that uh, this potential here carries an imaginary part. So there is an imaginary potential. This is a very interesting development, uh, which I will have much, much more to say. Uh, there is also approaches based on effective field theory, uh, in particular non-relativistic uh, QCD or non-relativistic potential QCD. Uh, and this is just a list of things which um, uh, which you can hear or read uh, on this topic. Um, I will not, uh, 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 since this is one of the topics which I will discuss in more detail later on in the lectures, I will not go on now uh, more deeply into, into it. The, just to conclude this first part of the, this first lecture, I want to emphasize one aspect which will motivate uh, this development of the second lecture, and that in all these cases which we have seen, uh, whether it's heavy quark, the jets, or quarkonia, we are dealing with a small system which is immersed in an environment which is much bigger and much more complicated. Um, and there are a bunch of techniques which have been developed in other contexts of physics, which goes under the name of open quantum system. And this is what I would like to discuss uh, with you in the rest of these lectures, with, of course, in mind uh, the specific application that I have been discussing uh, uh, today. But the techniques themselves are pretty general, and hopefully even for those of you who are not uh, uh, specializing in this field, you can uh, benefit from them. So with this, I will uh, end lecture one and start lecture two. Uh, do you have a question at this point? Uh, so lecture two will be different style. Um, I will uh, start doing something concretely and, uh, uh, and abandon generalities and words. OK. So if you have no question, I will just try. So this lecture two will be a, a general introduction to open quantum systems. Um, 
I will try to do as much as possible on the board. And I understand there will be tutorials, right? Uh, and Andrea, as a, as a volunteer, who, who were, was officially designed <laughs> as a tutor, but I, I don't know, uh, Andrea Berardo, yes. And I, I don't know how many uh, tutorials there will be, do you know? Two or three. Uh, we'll decide at lunch, okay, so. But anyway, I mean, I, I somehow count on tutorials to uh, fill in some of the details I won't have time to, uh, to, uh, to discuss on the board. So, introduction to open quantum systems. The word open refers to the fact that uh, the system we consider um, is open to the outside and uh, the, the spirit of, uh, of, the, uh, of this approach is to find effective theory, but contrary to most of what effective theory in, uh, in the context of quantum field theories are, uh, these are not theories which can be uh, formulated in terms of a Lagrangian or Hamiltonian. And the reason for that is that the dynamics that they uh, propose to describe is, um, is not a Hamiltonian dynamics. It contains possibility of exchange of energy between the system and its environment, and uh, that leads to dissipation. And uh, we will have to think a little bit harder about entropy consideration um, and, and things like this. Um, so typically, um, the Hamiltonian, of course, the system as a whole has a description in terms of Hamiltonian. So the Hamiltonian will be, let me call the system Q, that will be typically the heavy quark. And I think of the heavy quark as a test particle, as I have uh, uh, already emphasized. It's a particle which can be identified in the total environment. It's distinct from the, from the constituent of the environment. Then I have the Hamiltonian for the environment, which I call HB. <coughs> Excuse me. B comes from the fact that uh, most of the time the environment will be a thermal bath, like a quark gluon plasma, say, but it doesn't need to be. And then there will be an interaction between the system and the bath, which I call H1. And the notation are, uh, I hope, not confusing. So, the HQ will be just the Hamiltonian of the heavy quarks that I have uh, uh, described before. Single heavy quark to satisfy the discussion. So, the Hamiltonian of the heavy quarks is just a kinetic energy, p squared over 2m. Uh, the heavy quark will be considered as a non relativistic particle. And I ignore about uh, relativistic correction here. The Hamiltonian for the bath, I don't specify at this stage. It can be complicated. It describes typically the quark gluon plasma. So it's, it's, um, it's complicated, but as you will see uh, later, hopefully today, uh, I don't need the full knowledge about HB to, to make progress. And H1. H1 will be interaction between degrees of freedom of the uh, plasma and the heavy quark. And that I take to be of the form, so I put a minus sign here. For this is conventional, I mean, there is nothing deep here. Um, but I write here an integral over x of the density of x times a zero of x. So let me comment about that. Um, so x is a three vector. So it's an integration of a space. And n of x, let me immediately say what I mean by n of x. n of x is the density of the heavy quark. So it's an operator. And in first quantization, which I'm going to be using, 
is just to G, the charge, times um, X minus R. So I hope this is not confusing for you. This is an operator. This is the position operator. And I measure the density at point X with this delta function. So it just, this is a statement that the heavy quark uh, in this language here is localized at position X. And then at position X, it fills the field created by the plasma. And I'm going to assume that this field is, um, is uh, the Coulomb field. Um, this is easily generalized, but um, I am mostly interested in, uh, in the situation where the heavy quark moves slowly in the system. And as you know, the magnetic interaction are proportional. I mean, they are current current, current interaction. They involve the velocity of the heavy quark. So compared to the Coulomb interaction, they are down by factor V over C squared. So I'm going to ignore magnetic interaction. Under these circumstances, the Hamiltonian is simply uh, given by, by this here. So just to be sure that you understand the notation, if I look at the matrix element of H1 in the representation R, this is just minus G times A0 of R. Okay? Okay, now at that stage, uh, if I ignore the uh, HB, what I have is just the quantum mechanics of a heavy quark in the background field A0. Okay, so I couldn't. So if HB is equal to zero, then the dynamics can be uh, represented equivalently by a Schrodinger equation, h bar d by dt of psi is equal to minus h bar squared over m gradient squared uh, plus uh, g a0 of r times a function psi of r and t, right? I'm going to use Yeah, it depends whether... Yeah, it's 2M. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yes, there is no reduced mass here. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I am going to uh, go from... Uh, I'm going to use different languages at the same time. So don't be confused. I'm saying the same thing in different fashion because sometimes one language is more convenient than the other. So here I'm using first quantization. Here too, but I'm using explicitly Schrodinger equation. But this is the same. Okay. So, what I want to do now is uh, introduce a tool to be able to handle the, um, uh, the bass degrees of freedom. And to do that, I'm going to introduce a very useful object, which is called a density matrix. And the density matrix, I'm going to call it D. And that's a density matrix for the whole system at the moment. So D is a matrix which um, has the following property. If you think of a pure state, what's called a pure state, then D squared is equal to D, which means it's a projector, which means that D is essentially the projector of some particular quantum state psi. Now, the density matrix is really useful when we don't have a full information on the system. That is to say, um, we know that the states, uh, various eigenstates of the, of the total Hamiltonian, let me call psi n is the eigenstate of the Hamiltonian H. Yes, we know that some of these eigenstates are occupied with some probability so, which means that we don't have a full, the full quantum information that we could have, but there is some statistical element involved. 
and the density matrix will be the sum over n of the probability Pn that the given state uh, is, let's say, occupied. Uh, and, and that will be the general form of a statistical density matrix. Um, we have also another, uh, a couple of other general uh, properties that uh, D is the emission. Well, that's obvious on this form here. And the trace of D is equal to 1, which implies that uh, the sum of the Pn if the states are auto orthonormal, is equal to 1. OK. So now I would like to uh, use that. Oops. to uh, say something about the uh, system. Um, one, one of the interesting uh, aspects of density metrics is that we can construct so-called reduce density matrix and that I'm going to call DQ which is equal, by, de by definition, the trace of the vast degree of freedom of D. Well, that looks simple. Uh, of course, that trace is, in general, very hard to calculate. But there are a few cases where, where this can be done. Um, this can be done, in particular, the following context, which I'm going to assume we assume that at time t0, that will be my initial condition, d of t, 0, is equal a product of the density matrix of the system times the density matrix of the bus. In other words, I'm, supposed, I'm assuming that uh, I prepare the system with one heavy quark in a state characterized by the density matrix uh, DQ, and then the bass degrees of freedom ha have a density matrix DB. For instance, if the bass is in thermal equilibrium, uh, the density matrix of the bass will have this particular form with Pn equal to exponential minus beta En, En being the, now the eigenvalue not of H but of HB, divided by uh, Z, where Z is the so-called partition function. That is the sum of N of E to the minus beta En. That's one example. Okay? So then, then I am interested now at the evolution in time of this object. Well, to get the evolution in time, I'm, I'm going to, to, uh, to take shortcuts. You see that d, d of t will be given, if, assuming it's a pure state, it, it won't change very much if it, is a, if it is given by this expression for fixed probabilities. And this is what we are going to consider initially. So if I use this uh, uh, representation of d, you see that... Uh, uh, D of T can be written in the following way. Uh, there will be a, a, an evolution operator which carries a state from T0 to T. The density matrix at time T0 and another evolution operator U dagger of T and T0. If you wish, I, I, I'm just applying evolution operator on the left and on the right of this expression. And if the Pn are constant, uh, that holds also for a general statistical density matrix. And now, 
if, uh, if I remind you that the evolution operator obeys the equation u of t and t0 is equal to h u of t and t0 with the condition that u of t0, t0 is equal to 1, then you can easily derive the following equation for the t of d of t is equal to h commutator with d of t. That's sometimes called the Liouville-Van Neumann equation for the density matrix. So, so far this is, uh, this is exact. <coughs> And, of course, the initial condition is that d of t0 is known as d0, and d0 is, is, uh, is density matrix. Okay, so now I want to uh, formulate the kind of question that I am interested in um, using these uh, tools. So I'm going to ask the following question. Um, given if I have uh, put a heavy quark in the system at some initial time uh, in some location, what is the probability to find it at some later time in another location? Okay? So that probability I'm going to write as P. Location I'm going to call QF at final time Tf, Qi, Ti, and that's a probability which I, which I just uh, discussed. Now, this probability is going to be equal to the amplitude to go from position Qf um, with the bus in a state, uh, let's say, N. And, uh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, Fro from QI to QF and the bus in an arbitrary state N. And uh, in between, there will be the evolution operator taking me from TI to TF taking the whole system, quark plus bass, I want a probability, to, so I square the amplitude, and I want to sum over all possible states of the bass, the final state, and average over the initial state of the bass, that is to say sum over n with a probability pn, that uh, the particular state N is occupied in the bus. Okay? So again, if the bus is in thermal equilibrium, Pn is just a Boltzmann factor. Okay? But I can let it uh, be whatever I want. So now I claim that this can be rewritten in the following way, sum over M and N. Okay? Um, of uh, Pn. And I'm going to just uh, open the squared here, QFM, U, TF, TI, QE, QIN, QIN, U dagger, TF, TI, uh, QF, N. Right? So now I can uh, bring this PN here. And you see that this quantity here, sum of n of this uh, projector, is nothing but the, uh, density, the initial density matrix. So I can rewrite this as sum of m of qf m u t f t i, the density matrix at time t i, u dagger t f t i. QFM, 
And now you recognize here, according to the equation uh, which is written here, you recognize the density matrix at time Tf. Taken a matrix element, Qfm, Q, um, Qi, no, Qfm, Qfm. Sum over m. But what is sum over m of d? Uh, sum over m of d, uh, m d m. That is precisely the reduced density matrix of the system. This operation sum over m is precisely taking the trace of the full density matrix over the state of the bath. So this is what I called earlier, uh, let me write this explicitly, trace of the bath of D of Tf Qi. And that is nothing but Qf dq of Tf Qf. Okay? So is, is, that, is that clear for everybody? It's important that we fix the, I should not stay here. It's important that we fix uh, the, uh, the basics before we go too much further. Okay, this is a simple uh, calculation that uh, all of you should be able to do. But you see, it, it tells you one thing. It tells you that uh, this is important to really um, pay attention to the question we are asking. If we want to answer. And you will see later on, uh, very shortly, that I'll give you another question with a different answer. But if I have the probability that given that the system, it is a quark, is prepared at location qi at time ti, that I find it at location qf at time tf, this probability is given by the matrix element of the system density matrix in the state qf. So that's the first question I can ask. And now I want to ask another question, which will bring in another important quantity, which you may or may not recognize immediately. The other question I want to ask is the following. Let's assume that. Um, 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 I want not the, um, uh, the probability, but the propagator. Quotation mark, because propagators is a name that I'm going to use for related objects, uh, not always the same, but uh, propagator of the heavy quark. And I'm going to formulate that in a, in a way similar to this. So the propagator uh, will be given by a, a similar formula. However, um, let's see. Um, oh, yes, here it is. Um, um, what's the uh, what is the probability amplitude um, to find, um, uh, uh, to go from the, the, the state qi and ti to the state qf and the same state at time tf? Um, it, it looks like a, a similar question. But it is not quite. Um, and, and that object I'm going to call G bigger for reasons that will become clear uh, later of QF, TF, QE, uh, QI, TI. Now it's not quite the same question, so I can rewrite this as QF um, N. Uh, evolution operator 
from uh, Ti to Tf and Qin. You see, this is not quite the same um, uh, object. Um, I forgot, I was not specific enough in my question. I want to, to do the sum over all, sorry, let me, I want to do the sum over the average over the plasma more than sum over the plasma state. But you see, I am asking, I am asking a question about the heavy quark. I, I start at some location QI at time TI, let it evolve in the plasma until time QF TF. This is what the propagator means. Okay? But now the state of the plasma, I assume it is the same initially and finally. There is no, the plasma doesn't change state. And that is reflected in this sum here, sum over n of Pn. And that's not even uh, a matrix element of a density matrix. That's a different object, even though you will see uh, in, in a few minutes uh, that they, are, uh, they can be uh, obtained from very similar expression. Um, so, you're still with me for five more minutes or five, six, uh, because I would like to do something more. Um, so now I'm going to give you uh, expression, I mean, and try to motivate uh, expression for this matrix element here or this propagator. And that will go under the name of uh, in this was invented by Feynman uh, many, many years ago in dealing with uh, a similar problem where it's called Polaron problem in condensed matter physics which uh, involve uh, similar issues of a system, small system coupled to an environment. And I will uh, briefly uh, tell you how to obtain this uh, functional. And um, that will be all I will be able to do today. But I would like to at least arrive there. So <clears throat> the first step would be to calculate the amplitude QF, TF, QI, TI for a free particle. That's given by uh, a Feynman pass integral. That's elementary quantum mechanics now. From, so I, I'm integrating on all the paths, DQ of T, where, which join uh, QI to QF in time uh, tf minus ti. So this is uh, uh, i times the action of the heavy quark, which is a functional of the pass. And if I want to be uh, more explicit, I can write the action explicitly as the row of q is, uh, is m over 2 times the integral from ti to tf Q dot, the velocity square of T, dt. Okay? Okay. Now, if I want to calculate the uh, probability, uh, I have to square the amplitude, and that will bring in another factor. So if I want to calculate the probability QF, TF, uh, QI, modulus squared, then I have two integrals. And like this. And one will be complex conjugate of the other. So I will be one integral with e to the is, and another integral with e to the minus is. Now, it's convenient to replace this two integral by an integral over a contour, which I call C, and the same formula. And what I want to do is to explain this and convince you that uh, this is indeed the correct. So the contour will be a contour in the complex time plane. So I'm going to 
uh, go from, let's say, this is Ti, this is T sub f. And in the first integral, the time runs from Ti to T sub f. And in the second integral, which is a complex conjugate, it's convenient to think of time as running backward. That's a minus sign of i going to minus i, which I can equivalently uh, capture by changing the boundary integration. Instead of integrating from ti to tf, I can integrate from tf to ti, which is essentially which I do here. And uh, I will get the answer. So this is called uh, schwinger keldiv Keldish contour, because this was invented, introduced by these uh, two gentlemen many years ago. And I will be using uh, this uh, in an uh, in, um, important way. So it's important that you understand. This is nothing very spectacular, very difficult to understand. It's such a fact that when I calculate a probability, I have to square an amplitude. And squaring the amplitude, uh, I can do, I mean, it's just a matter of keeping tracks of the integral uh, of the time integration. And in this particular context here, uh, it's obvious that uh, if I do that, I, I recuperate the, the right thing. Now, instead of, of uh, having a time which run on this contour, I can also rewrite this as an integral uh, dq1 of t exponential i, uh, let me write it explicitly, exponential i q dot squared uh, times an integral dq2 of t exponential, uh, so from ti to tf, exponential i from um, tf to ti of q dot squared dt. <coughs> in other words, I can duplicate the coordinates, and that will be useful. So I call Q1 of t the coordinate here, Q2 of t the coordinate here, and keep time running from Ti to Tf. There are two equivalent ways to, to do the same thing. I mean, either I introduce a curvilinear coordinate along this path, or I say that I have a single path, but I have to distinguish the coordinates which go forward on the upper, upper, upper branch here and the coordinates which go backward on the lower branch. Uh, two, two equivalent ways to, to, to say the same thing. Um, I will just give you the result because of the time uh, constraint. But this is important that you understand this. Uh, uh, if you see this for the first time, it can be a bit confusing. It's actually, uh, what I want to insist is that actually very simple and uh, we're going to make a good use of that. Um, so let me give you the result. I don't have time to, uh, uh, to really prove it today, but we shall do that tomorrow. So I have, I have treated the case of a single particle, a free particle. Now I can elaborate a little bit. I can write a QF, F, a QI, TI. A particle, so for the Hamiltonian, H equal HQ plus, that will be integral over the contour, DQ of T exponential uh, i s0 plus uh, s1 and s1 is just uh, the integral of um, h1 over x. That is to say, let me write it more, uh, uh, n of x times a0 of x. And I should, I should write this as n of x and t, a of x and t, uh, dt, this is an integral of x and an integral dt of ti to tf. 
right? I mean, nothing really happens uh, dramatically if I change uh, the free particle into a particle which interacts with the background field A0. Now, the trace, I'll come back to this tomorrow because this is going too fast, but I want to at least show you where we are uh, heading to. to. Uh, the trace of a B will be an average over A0. It will be equivalent to averaging over A0. And this is where making contact with the statistical type of argument that I was mentioning before. That is to say, uh, eventually we want to treat the effect of collision. And in this particular context, uh, uh, the collision will, uh, will be uh, rephrased in terms of averaging of a random background field. And once you do that, let me give you the final result. The probability, which I have written over there, of QF TF, QI TI, will be given by this integral over a contour, but now it's an integral over A0 of exponential I S B of A0 times exponential I G uh, times A0, integral over A0. And uh, this integral, you see, now, now I'm averaging over the plasma degrees of freedom. And if this averaging is a Gaussian averaging, and I will not justify it today, but if it is so, I can apply Vick theorem. And the final result, oh, excuse me, I, I forgot. Excuse me. I am also being tired. Of course, EI is 0 of Q. But this factorize, so I'm focusing here on this part of the functional integral. So it's exponential i s zero q times exponential i phi of q and phi. Let me continue here. Phi of q has a very simple form. This is what I wanted to show you, and uh, we'll come back to this tomorrow is g squared over 2 times an integral along the contour of dt1, dt2 of a quantity which I call a Green's function or correlator or propagator q of t1, t2, q of t2. And this is a very important formula which captures basically what we want to do Again, there are, there are approximations done uh, to get this formula. Um, but you see, I mean, this is the effective theory for the heavy quark once the uh, plasma degrees of freedom have been eliminated. And all what survive in this expression, all what matters from all, all the knowledge you need to have about the plasma is the expression of this correlator. You see, it's, an int it's a Feynman pass integral. It's an integral of all pass dq, where, with a correlator which depends only on the plasma degrees of freedom, which is evaluated along the trajectory. Now, this is a non-local object, which means, in particular, that there is no uh, Hamiltonian uh, formulation. We will see that in some particular cases, this can be made local, and, and then we recover uh, some of the dynamical systems that we know uh, and, and know how to handle, which are essentially Hamiltonian. But in case, there are cases, in particular in QCD, where this type of approximation cannot, cannot be made. OK, this is going too fast, but um, we'll return to this tomorrow. And, um, and, and perhaps in one of the tutorials, uh, Andrea will show you how to calculate explicitly this functional uh, for, for electrodynamics for a pair of charged particles. OK? But I will come back to this tomorrow. But this is just to give you a, a feeling for where we are driving to. OK, so thank you for your attention. Thank you. Uh, yeah.